Welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Dennis Bergen, and for the last 20 years I have been working as the director of the James Hoban Societies of Ireland and the United States, um, aimed at promoting the work of James Hoban, uh, the architect of the White House, and also the influences uh, in Dublin and elsewhere that uh, created his uh, expertise. Um, the general picture that Brian O'Connell so carefully explained to us recently, and will hopefully do it again today, is that the position of Leinster House as the home of the principal gentleman of Ireland was something that appealed to George Washington. He was not, did not want to be king, he did not want to be in any way lauded, but he thought a house such as a principal gentleman might have would suit him very well. Of course, he never got to live in it, but in fact, those who did live in it, I think, um, in many ways, didn't live the kind of lives that country gentlemen would have lived. But that's including some of the recent um, uh, occupants. But we won't go into that today. We're talking specifically about history. So I'm going to just make a very few uh, introductory remarks for, over the next 10 minutes and really begin um, in Thistle Dermot, which is a, an early name for Castle Dermot. And it was interesting just to talk to Colette Jordan there, who's doing a special study of this building. This wonderful castle, Kilkea Castle, which was a great Fitzgerald stronghold um, and has been for many years a hotel. One of the interesting studies in Irish architecture must surely be what kind of buildings make good hotels in a historical sense. There were um, Ashford Castle from 1939 and Dromolin from 1962, but I actually organized a conference there in 1978 and it was pretty acceptable then. Um, of course, the major uh, Fitzgerald uh, operation was out of Maynooth Castle. And this is a, a recreation of how Maynooth Castle might have looked in its heyday when it contained many different elements, um, in, including a church, a, a school and a library, and of course the living quarters for the family. It was probably one of the great tragedies that this amazing complex was really in ruin virtually from the Middle Ages onward, late Middle Ages onward. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, about the development of Maynooth was that the Dukes of Leinster had such an interesting and um, significant part in it. Uh, these two houses, the one at the top and, and the one at the bottom, were actually built by a father and son, John, both named John Stoyt, who were regarded, I believe, as the agents at one time of the Dukes of Leinster. Um, they seemingly had some connection to Wicklow as well, so whether they were freelancing or whether they went out on their own as property owners, we don't know. But these buildings, the, the top one is Stoyt House and the bottom one is Riverstone Lodge, were definitely intended for rent. There is no indication that any of the Stoyts or anybody else had any intention of living in them. Um, the very early development of Maynooth was pretty dramatic. W within a decade, they had these wings built onto Maynooth, which are still there, have been much replenished and rehabilitated over the years, but formed the basic core of what became uh, Maynooth College. Uh, but you can see also from the uh, Historic Towns Atlas of Maynooth and this illustration on the front that it was actually in, in ruins virtually from the kind of early 1600s, late 1600s onwards, and that it was populated around by various small dwellings and a bit of a kip, quite honestly. Um, what is very interesting about the Stoit building, Maynooth, as you know, uh, has changed greatly over the years, and I'm very involved with its heritage, um, but the Stoit house is the residence of the um, president of Maynooth, not the residence, the official office of the president of Maynooth, who is a Cherik, a man so low profile that nobody could probably tell me his name, even though it should be a name that some people know. His name is Michael Molani. Uh, but Riverstown Lodge has always been the administrative headquarters, even in the old days of Maynooth, where the bursar lived. The bursar was at that time a priest. It is now the headquarters of Maynooth University. It's at the very extreme end of the South Campus, so that the person who is guiding the um, activities of the university, their reach is actually right across the whole South Campus, right across the Kilcock Road, and right into the main North Campus, which is where all the modern buildings are. And you'll be interested to know, if you don't know already, that the current president of Maynooth University is a Finnish lady who has just come from New Zealand. Um, 
What's interesting about Maynooth, of course, is that of all the uh, buildings in that uh, particular complex that we looked at, this is still standing, St. Mary's Church. You can see it here from the earlier picture. Um, you might even learn how to do this. Yeah, see it here? And here it is in real life. Here is the area which is still reserved for the Dukes of Leinster. This was during COVID, so they had observed. And Colette Jordan has this wonderful picture of the next Duke of Leinster standing outside the White House in Washington, which is a great, for us in the James Hogan Society, a great picture to have. But he may come back someday, and when he does, Eugene Griffin will admit him into this area here. This is the inside of the church, very historic church, a very good looking church, and this is Eugene um, outside it. And it has a huge amount of history, including, uh, as we talked to, which with Colette earlier, this tower here where there are many of Fitzgerald's buried, particularly children, and where Edward Fox Fitzgerald, the son of Lord Edward Fitzgerald, is also buried. And so this is uh, a picture of Maynooth from the sky. You can see that the, the, ca the remains of the castle are here. A little bit sad, I think, for the importance it once had. Uh, the, the church is right in the territory here, uh, this is Stoyt House, this is Riverstown Lodge, and, and this is the area which in the historic atlas is indicated as a place where a council house once st stood, which may actually mean that there was a gathering place there, similar maybe to the one that had been in Cecil Dermot earlier. And then the question is, is it still a, a, a power center? This is the South Campus, we can see here, over here, the college chapel, the fusion kind of quadrangle here, the college chapel, Columba House, or Columba Center, um, the John Powell Library, and the Aula Maxima. And these four buildings, pretty well, these three buildings represent the old regime in Maynooth and haven't much changed. This is, of course, the Scott Allen Walker building uh, that was created in uh, 1984, an amazing production and statement about the future of Irish education, university education, and the church. What's interesting is that this is the headquarters of the Irish Episcopate, which had no headquarters up until probably in the last 10 years. Effectively, there was an administration of some kind there, and there were people administering various committees, but it had no permanent kind of central location. And this is the bishops in their new meeting room, which is the old chapel of what was the senior infirmary in Maynooth. This is the Alda Maxima, a jerry-built building um, that didn't survive very long in its first um, emanation. And this is the famous Gun Chapel, a tremendous mystery on which I've written a long article for We Remember Maynooth because nobody knows what or who Gun is. Is it an, a weapon or a person? And then this is a building we've heard a lot about today. This is Carton. And, um, this is the lovely uh, little chapel kind of uh, area where a burial place too, I think, Colette, isn't it? Isn't that? The burial place is down to the, to the other side. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that it, it, the photograph is actually taken by a company in Kilkenny called Willie Duggan Lighting. And Willie was a famous rugby player who, who created this wonderful lighting company, which is very, very adept. His son is now running it. But you may be interested to know that it is also now a center of great spiritual power. And in the bottom picture here, we have a strange bringing together of senior clerics who are honoring this man. And this man is Father Bill Atkinson. He's a, uh, he's now dead, he's a, an Augustinian father who was paralyzed in, in an accident and became a priest. And these are the people presenting the cause for his beatification in very recent times, I can't tell you exactly. And you may ask what connection it has <coughs> with Carton. Father Bill Atkinson's sister owns Carton. So there is a strange kind of uh, uh, eerie spirituality about the place when you go in there these days. Um, <coughs> Today, to set the theme for this afternoon, we are talking about the, the, the three Irish parliaments. That's an interesting picture. I was in the Doyle the other day with, with Alan Ruan, the head usher, and he was explaining to us about how they changed it from accommodating 700 people to, um, as they do now, 160, which was basically by filling in all the steps that go down along. And here's the original steps. 
I don't know how many are there and I don't know how many are there now, but that was how they modified the actual layout and Stormont, about which we'll be hearing something as well. And then the back view of Leinster House, I, I was very interested this morning to hear the, the comments about parking lots and um, in, in actual fact, between, between us here, Leinster House is not the proper presentation of a national parliament when we look at what other people have done. Um, and there is a concern that Count Corla expressed it when we presented our drawings to him the other day. Um, and Tomas O'Connor, hopefully, will the new uh, conservation architect, and, um, uh, we, we, we'll get some something done on it. But everything that was said this morning deserves to be said. The railings should be taken down. There should be no little plastic shop in which television cameras can be put. But anyway, um, that is the view that has been now emphasized because in the recent renovation, they changed the emphasis on the diplomatic entrance to the back so that the distinguished um, visitors now come in through the back. Um, and this is the other parliaments, of course, that Irish people have uh, served in, of, whom, of which in, in, in total, there are three in Ireland and three abroad. This you'll be interested here. I'm sure you all know it's the the Henry Spack building in, uh, in Brussels, and as of this morning, they are now going to knock it and replace it with a building that will cost the same cost, basically, as a children's hospital does in Ireland, 543 million. This is Strasbourg with the hemicycle. This is Luxembourg, which was the original uh, meeting place of the uh, European Parliament. And this is the mother of parliaments with its three eldest children, the Tinwald, the states of Guernsey, and the states of Jersey. And then you have the new developments um, designed sometimes by foreign architects in Scotland and Wales. And I think they set a scene, really, for what we should expect and what we should be demanding of our parliamentary buildings. These, the next ones actually are the three illustrations that we commissioned uh, from Ron Wilson, uh, where we tried to do an exact study of the building, uh, the complex at each stage. These are the detailed ones. There's an overall view. They're all on display downstairs. I just wanted to show you the other work that we've been doing on, on, on this project for the last three years. That shows Leinster House, uh, you know, with, with the use of the rooms. At one time, we thought we might actually get to um, have little vignettes of what was happening in each room, but it turned into a dog's dinner, and we really didn't follow it. And then this amazing complex of buildings that we've been talking about all morning. Um, you know, we, we designated them when they came in, each with an individual history, and the uh, Royal College of Science, and omitted from that is the engineering building, that at the end, I don't know what the dates on that were, where, where it came in. We do know that some of the wings of the building were still being completed in 1922. And then this is a, a, a detailed layout of the, the doll as it is now. And what we tried to do there was take and, and give credit to the architects. Generally, the architects who work on Leinster House don't get an awful lot of credit. Um, Donnelly and Turpin did this, an interesting building there. You have the main building, which has just been renovated. You have the old lecture theatre. You have this building here in 1966 by Joseph Alcock, uh, one of the Liverpool architects, um, very influential in Irish circles at that time. But the poor man died in the same year the building was completed. You have the 1933 building, which is where the Labour Party has been since 1933. They've seemingly rarely come out of it, but there's, a no -P <laughs> there's an OPW uh, area in the, in the bottom of that building, I understand. And, and then you have the engineering building. And, and, and of course, these buildings um, and, and that building here are all dedicated to the greater cause of have, uh, deputies having comfortable offices. Um, so I just wanted to show you that as, as an example of what we've been doing. And the other thing I wanted to say is that in all of the studies that we've been doing and, and, um, over the years, we've always been conscious that people were associated um, with the building. We haven't been able to show that in any kind of detail today or even any time because it, it just got a little bit too unwieldy and COVID interfered and we couldn't do the research. But there is a hope that someday we might be able to chronicle all of the people involved in the development of a building like um, Leicester House. Sister Mary Kevin O'Higgins, as you, you probably know, they introduced into the doll the first real baby of the Cabin Corda, called, called it the other day, as a deputy from Clare who brought a child into the house. And the Cabin Corda greeted her and said, We're glad to welcome the first real baby, seemingly 
signifying that he thought some of the other people in the dog were babies as well, but not quite <laughs> real. But um, this woman has the distinction, I think like all of her family, of having been born in Leicester House. Not quite in Leicester House, but in one of the recently completed parts of the Royal College of Science. Because one of the great, as Brian will explain, one of the great motivating factors in choosing the House for the Doy was that it was a secure build. And it was so secure, um, or it wasn't so secure that everybody was happy to just walk in and out, but some people actually decided to stay there. And one of them was Kevin O'Higgins. And um, I, I don't know the exact number, but maybe three or I, I doubt if they stayed there for very long, maybe two or three. Uh, of, of his family were buried. Some, uh, certainly more than one, I think. But um, this woman died earlier this year, and she is, I believe, the last person to be, to, who can claim to be born in Leinster House. So that was my little introductory um, spiel, and now I go on to the very serious business of introducing the speaker.